It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Ambassador Ryan Crocker became the preeminent American diplomat in the Middle East over four decades as a Foreign Service officer and advisor to presidents from both parties. He served as ambassador to Lebanon, Kuwait, Syria, Pakistan, and both Iraq and Afghanistan at the height of U.S. military engagement in those still unstable countries. Now retired from government service, Ambassador Crocker remains a deeply influential voice as the Obama administration struggles with a ruthless civil war in Syria that threatens to set the region ablaze. The displacement of millions of refugees, uncertain nuclear disarmament talks with Iran, threats of airstrikes by Israel, and a resurgence of al-Qaeda in Iraq. To discuss all that is happening in the Middle East and what he sees as right or wrong about current U.S. policy there, Ambassador Ryan Crocker joins us again on American Forum. Thank you for coming back to the program. Thank you, Doug. Great to be here. Let's go right into the Iran situation. Recently, you published an op-ed in U.S. News & World Report that implicitly criticized, certainly disagreed with, a group of a large group of members of Congress who have been pressing for additional economic sanctions to be imposed on Iran, even as negotiations continue around the implementation of an agreement under which Iran has ostensibly agreed to end its uh, pursuit of, of nuclear weapons. But what's the substance of your criticism of that position, and also where do you see that, that entire situation going? Uh, Doug, there is no question in my mind that the uh, uh, sanctions that have been imposed and the, uh, um, the unity of the international community in enforcing them uh, was instrumental in uh, bringing Iran under its new leadership to the negotiating uh, table. Uh, those sanctions uh, on our side were um, largely enacted by Congress. It's a good thing. I support them. Uh, I support retaining them uh, until we see if we can get to a, a final agreement. But there can be too much of a good thing. Uh, 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 Iran has its own hard hardliners. Uh, we saw last week that um, uh, uh, Iranian TV uh, refused for more than an hour to broadcast a live speech by President Rouhani. Uh, uh, so additional sanctions, I think, would be too much of a good thing. Um, it would play right into the hands of the hardliners um, and probably would derail the, uh, the negotiations. So uh, you know, I've written several op-eds to that effect. Um, uh, I've signed an open letter uh, saying, Sanctions got us to where we are. Now let's let the diplomats do their job. So how do you see the, the situation playing out? Uh, well, you know, my years in the Middle East have uh, uh, taught me that an extreme and risky long-range prediction would be what might happen, say, a week from Friday. <laughs> uh, uh, I just... Uh, hope very much that on our side uh, uh, there is an understanding that um, there is an awful lot of baggage and mistrust on both sides um, that is not going to be swept away um, uh, easily or quickly. So we're going to need uh, something that um, is in pretty short supply among Americans, strategic patience. And we are going to need persistence. Um, uh, and we are going to need, uh, for lots of historical reasons that we can go into, um, to avoid um, uh, issuing ultimatums, um, uh, making demands beyond the uh, obvious one that we need to get to an agreement that uh, uh, provides the world the assurance that Iran uh, does not have and will not have a nuclear 
uh, weapons program, and that, that will be verifiable. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, we need to proceed, you know, carefully and with adequate attention to um, uh, uh, the long, often troubled history between our two countries. I confess that e even reading the news coverage of the events there and the negotiations and the sense of optimism and skepticism at the same time, I still don't completely understand what is on the table now. Well, broadly speaking, uh, Doug, what has to be worked out um, uh, is for Iran to take uh, the steps uh, that will assure the world um, they do not have uh, a nuclear weapons program um, and that uh, they will uh, permit the kind of intensive uh, uh, international scrutiny uh, that provides us all with the confidence that they will not have one. Uh, in concrete terms, uh, uh, it means moving ahead with the IAEA as well as the, um, uh, the P5 plus one uh, negotiations, uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council plus, uh, plus Germany, um, uh, and provide, again, an adequate level of transparency. In concrete terms, uh, it means uh, uh, they will have to continue the process of um, uh, reconverting their 20% uh, uh, enriched uranium stockpiles uh, 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 into a uh, into a form um, where they cannot, uh, as the phrase is, break out into a nuclear weapons program. 20% uh, brings them pretty close, so that will need to um, uh, uh, be part of the deal. Um, uh, there are massive numbers of centrifuges, uh, far in excess of uh, what is needed for um, uh, a peaceful nuclear program, um, are going to have to be uh, 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 dismantled or um, or turned over. Um, and then, you know, we can talk about what might be an acceptable level of enrichment. Um, Three percent is the norm. Uh, for um, uh, countries around the world that do have peaceful nuclear programs. Um, uh, I do not think it is realistic, frankly, um, for us to take the position that uh, Iran must terminate all nuclear activities. Um, um, uh, they do have a right as a signatory to the NPT uh, uh, to uh, develop uh, nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, and um, I think we have to accept that. Let's also quickly touch on Syria, the other, the other really hot button question of the moment. A year ago, I recall talking to you, and your view on the Obama administration's approach to Syria was you certainly were not enthralled with the, uh, the approach the government appeared to be taking. What's your, what's your assessment of the situation in Syria right now and the American position in connection to it? Well, it is a horrendous uh, situation, uh, the developments in Homs where uh, uh, an agreement between the government and the opposition to allow um, uh, relief supplies in and uh, 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 civilians out uh, uh, was not exactly um, um, uh, adhered to uh, by uh, government forces in particular. Uh, uh, civilians trying to leave under a uh, what they thought was a safe conduct uh, wound up uh, being targeted by snipers. Uh, uh, very little food got in. Uh, it demonstrates how extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult it's going to be even to get uh, agreements that work localized and purely humanitarian in nature. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm afraid that um, uh, we are going to see more violence. Um, uh, I think the administration was right uh, to um, avoid the uh, uh, the trap of interference in um, a civil war. Uh, we tried that next door in Lebanon uh, when I was there in the um, 
early 1980s after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, it did not end well for us. 241 dead Marines on October 23rd, uh, 1983. And you were there, weren't you? I was there. Well, I think there are uh, several things we can and must do. At first, we have got to take every step we can in coordination with our international partners to see that this uh, uh, blazing inferno inside Syria uh, does not further spread outside. Um, and it is spreading. Um, uh, we have seen uh, Al-Qaeda uh, uh, basically take over a major city inside Iraq, Fallujah. Um, uh, this is partly the result of uh, the increased radicalization of the opposition in Syria, um, partly the result of policies of the Iraqi government um, that were seen by the Sunni population as directed against them that uh, uh, gave an opening to um, uh, al-Qaeda. Uh, so we have to do what we can uh, to uh, uh, support uh, the government in a constructive way, uh, including maybe some advice on policy, and to support uh, Iraq's Sunni tribes uh, who will bear the brunt of the fighting. Um, uh, in Lebanon, uh, we've seen a series of bombings and attacks, uh, uh, Sunnis against uh, Shia, Shia against Sunnis, uh, all spill over uh, from the, uh, the conflict in Syria. Uh, and Lebanon is also reeling under uh, a, a huge uh, refugee population burden, uh, uh, as is Jordan. Uh, so, you know, we've got to do what we can to contain um, uh, this conflagration uh, 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 so that it does not ignite um, a conflict really on sectarian lines throughout the Middle East. Uh, and I think there is more that um, uh, we, we can and should be doing. I would like to see Secretary Kerry uh, in the immediate area. Uh, I know he's got a lot to do, but we just simply cannot uh, afford to let the whole region uh, uh, catch fire. Mm. I, I, I'd make one other point. Um, uh, we are talking to the Iranians, obviously. Um, we are doing so bilaterally as well as multilaterally. Uh, uh, I think we should be giving consideration to uh, talking to the um, Iranians also about Syria, because what we're seeing with the uh, um, growth of an Al-Qaeda-affiliated opposition that really is in the ascendancy, um, uh, considerably stronger than the um, Free Syrian Army and its allies that um, we uh, sort of sometimes support. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda is our enemy, um, it is Iran's enemy, um, and it is the Assad regime's enemy. Um, and I think we should be exploring. Um, That's quite a set of bedfellows. Uh, you know, look, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the Middle East. There aren't many really nice guys. Um, <laughs> And now this description that you give of these uh, flaring conflicts all around Syria uh, is terribly frightening. And what, what is it that we could do other than uh, uh, Secretary of State Kerry being more in the region and talking? Uh, uh, demonstrate engagement, both um, um, politically, diplomatically, and concretely. Um, uh, we need to be having a a serious discussion, for example, with the uh, uh, Iraqis about uh, what they, uh, they really need um, uh, to be able to counter the Al-Qaeda threat. Uh, uh, we've uh, been in this situation before. In 2007, 2008, when I was ambassador there, um, Al-Qaeda was still a potent force, uh, but uh, working together, um, uh, the US and Iraq, both militarily and um, uh, in the field of intelligence, you know, um, the um, 
pithy little phrase is uh, find, fix, finish. Uh, you got to find them, uh, you got to fix them in place, and you have to finish them. Uh, uh, I would like to see us doing everything we can, uh, not with our boots on the ground, but perhaps with more advisors uh, uh, for Iraqi forces, and certainly more uh, uh, intelligence coordination against, uh, again, a, a common enemy. I think we should look at uh, uh, the weapon systems they need and need in a hurry. Uh, uh, we have agreed to sell them uh, Apaches and F-16s. Uh, well, those will be several years down the line. Their uh, F-16s are not much uh, 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 use in this kind of conflict. Um, Apaches are, but it's going to be, you know, a good long time before those aircraft are delivered and. Uh, uh, Iraqi crews are proficient in the um, employment of a very, very sophisticated weapon system. Uh, uh, the Iraqis on their own have gone out and purchased uh, MI-35 attack helicopters uh, um, uh, manufactured by Russia and other former East Bloc countries. Um, we have purchased for them MI-17s, which are basically uh, transport helicopters, but uh, can and have been uh, fitted with uh, uh, heavy machine guns. Um, they know how to operate those. They know how to maintain them. Um, and uh, they can be a very, very potent uh, weapon against an enemy who has no aviation or really sub significant uh, uh, anti-aviation capability. It's these kinds of things. Um, uh, we have been having that sort of dialogue with, uh, with Jordan. Um, I think we need to intensify it with Lebanon. In Iraq, the, the impression I think most Americans have is the assumption in the U.S. that once our forces are out, once we're not there to back them up, that in reality uh, these new militaries that we have a part in building up, that, that ultimately they will always collapse. Can Iraq, with the right support, actually stand on its feet and fight off uh, really uh, passionate and, and uh, hardy fighting forces? Um. You're asking a, a military question that fundamentally has a political answer, in my view. I alluded earlier to uh, some of the uh, policies of the uh, Maliki government, uh, a Shia-led government that have been perceived as uh, uh, directed against the Sunnis, have led to uh, uh, well over a year of, of protests that uh, sometimes have turned violent. Um, uh, as they did at the end of uh, the past year when um, uh, Iraqi forces uh, opened fire on uh, Sunni demonstrators in the western uh, city of Ramadi, uh, uh, killing dozens. Uh, and that led to a, uh, a daisy chain uh, that Al-Qaeda took advantage of. Uh, I think the prime minister realized he'd uh, 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 badly overstepped uh, in a very volatile situation. He pulled forces out of uh, the predominantly uh, Sunni cities of Ramadi and Fallujah, and Al-Qaeda walked right in. Uh, uh, I think the Prime Minister has been wise in not using um, uh, Iraqi uh, armed forces to dislodge the Sunnis, working instead uh, very closely with the tribes uh, uh, who say they are uh, ready, willing, and able uh, to get rid of uh, al-Qaeda in their midst. Uh, uh, they have had a long, bloody experience with al-Qaeda dating back to 04, 05. Uh, uh, and though, though they share, uh, share the same uh, religion, or the same sect, uh, Sunnis, uh, uh, they, are, uh, they are enemies. Um, so using the armed forces as a cordon, uh, consulting closely with the tribes uh, as to what they may need to get the job done, and above all, signaling uh, that um, they're all Iraqis together, I think is going to be as important uh, as uh, any military action. And I, I would um, challenge the, um, the assumption that uh, without us around, uh, military forces in Iraq and in Afghanistan um, are going to collapse. Um, 
Uh, Iraq has a long and strong military tradition. Uh, uh, there is great pride in wearing the uniform um, in Iraq. And many of the senior commanders uh, of the Iraqi forces uh, uh, also soldiered under Saddam. Uh, uh, so if the Iraqis can get the politics right, uh, I think the Iraqi armed forces, both the national police um, uh, and the army, uh, are adequate to any conceivable challenge. But the politics have to be right. Mm. When I was ambassador, we worked very, very hard to get the international commitments in place that would sustain a very substantial uh, uh, Afghan force, about 260,000 uh, police and uh, 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 army combined through the out years. Um, uh, the Afghan military is in the lead uh, almost everywhere in the country. Uh, they're taking a lot of casualties, um, but they more than held their own in this last fighting season uh, against the Taliban uh, with minimal U.S. support. Uh, so, you know, they're fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are able to continue a robust training program, and above all, if um, we are able to ensure with our allies and friends uh, that uh, they receive um, the funding and the equipment uh, needed to um, uh, uh, take on the Taliban, I think they can do it. Mm. So it's not the South Vietnamese army over, uh, playing itself uh, out over again in, in both of these countries? Uh, no, no, not at all. Um, uh, again, uh, you, know, you know, what you don't have in either country is uh, uh, a, a North Vietnam um, uh, backing the Viet Cong um, and China backing North Vietnam. Um, uh, uh, that uh, particular axis, I won't call it the axis of evil, uh, um, mercifully doesn't exist in the case of either Afghanistan or Iraq. You've got more confidence, it sounds, than most that, uh, that, that that is still resurrecting itself and that maybe there's leadership that could identify the necessary steps to, to do that and make the sort of compromises that have to be made. Uh, Doug, that's the big if. Um, uh, certainly the way the Maliki government is handling the um, very grim situation in Fallujah suggests they, they have learned a lesson uh, uh, to... Uh, treat the Sunni tribes as, uh, as allies, uh, uh, as much Iraqi as, uh, as the Shia are, uh, to address um, legitimate grievances, uh, to make them a, a full party and partner uh, in governance. Uh, if that is indeed the case, uh, uh, the, the tragedy of Fallujah may turn out to be the, um, the salvation of the state. How does the, the turn of events in Fallujah affect you personally? I mean, that's a place where there was so much loss of American life and so much loss of, of Iraqis as well. I mean, so much struggle went into that, and then to see it essentially undone as quickly as that happened, how, how does that strike you personally? Um, my uh, uh, short and medium-term optimism on Iraq was always, shall we say, under control. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I had a front row seat uh, on um, uh, a lot of unresolved issues um, uh, that are still unresolved, a lot of um, uh, ethnic and sectarian tension, uh, Arab Sunnis and Shia, and then uh, the Kurds as an ethnic group. Um, uh, these tensions built up over decades, part of Saddam's uh, 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 political and security, security mani manipulation of, of populations. Uh, uh, they all shared one thing in common, all three groups. They all were oppressed in different ways at different times by the regime. Uh, and that has left scars and, um, and, and mistrust that, uh, uh, that have to be overcome. I, I talked about U.S. diplomatic engagement at a high level, um, and I can't underscore the importance of this, Doug. Um, uh, we are hardwired 
uh, into the post-2003 Iraqi political system. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of my time uh, during my two years as ambassador um, uh, trying to put out fires, um, arrange compromises, um, uh, find areas of cooperation among the different communities. And what I discovered is um, for all three communities, uh, zero-sum thinking is pervasive. Any concession by us to them um, is a victory for them and a defeat for us. Um, and uh, given Iraq's bloody history, um, a defeat can be fatal. Uh, however, uh, if they had confidence in a middleman, um, and we were the middlemen of choice, um, you know, we found that what they couldn't give to each other, they could give to us, our own history. And, uh, sitting here on the uh, campus of Thomas Jefferson, um, I'm keenly aware of it, uh, 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 had some pretty big bumps in it. Um, the um, founding fathers didn't quite get it right in uh, drawing up the Constitution. Uh, they pushed some hard issues down the road, slavery, states' rights, and we had us a big old bloody civil war, you know, 70 years later. Um, uh, democracy is hard, and it takes time. Yeah. It uh, is interesting how often we, uh, we, uh, we take this modern perspective that these are places that have these terrible conflicts, and it must be that there's just something innate to, the, to these people, whichever group we're talking about. They just can't seem to figure out a way to get along and stop fighting with one another, though in reality they, they, they look at about the same level of irrationality that we looked at, that we must have appeared in 1860. So. And democracy does not come in a box. Uh, uh, you don't just ship it off to them and say, uh, follow the instructions uh, 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 for assembly, and uh, you're going to be good to go. It, uh, it, it has to be generated locally, taking into account uh, uh, history, culture, politics of that country, and it's really hard, and it takes time. But you're also uh, you're suggesting this level of engagement and sort of serious involvement in Iraq and I assume the same in Afghanistan and then new kind of engagements in Syria and other parts of the Middle East at a time when overwhelmingly Americans just want to forget that Iraq even exists, I think. Uh, and I mean, how, how plausible is it, how important is it for, uh, for Americans to, to actually get behind some sort of a, any level of risk again in Iraq? Well, again, I am not suggesting that um, uh, we deploy combat forces. Um, you know, that is something Americans absolutely would not accept. I'm not sure Iraqis would accept it either. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about uh, a larger advisory presence. I'm talking about some enablers that uh, uh, the Iraqis do not have. I'm talking about uh, acquisitions of weapon systems that they can obtain and use now. Um, and I'm talking about, again, political engagement, uh, helping them get the politics right uh, over time. Um, uh, you know, I don't think the, uh, the cost or the risks are unacceptably high. I do think we've got to remind ourselves as Americans that, um, uh, you know, we can say the war's over. Um, uh, and that we're going on to other things, uh, whether it be in Iraq or Afghanistan. But guess what? The war isn't over. Um, and it's going to go on with or without us. Uh, and without us, uh, if we didn't like, say, the first three acts of this play, the next 25 acts without us are going to be something we like even less. Uh, uh, we can say, let's forget about Iraq. Well, um, uh, when we turn our back on um, significant conflicts in that part of the world, uh, they have a way of getting our attention uh, in a manner that we really may not like. Uh, like our abandonment of, of Afghanistan. Precisely. Right. You know, we could see the Civil War coming. 
uh, the, the only thing uniting the, uniting the, the seven major Mujahideen groups was uh, uh, antipathy toward the Soviets. No Soviets. We could see that they were going to turn on each other. Uh, and boy, did they with a vengeance. That, that was not our problem. Hey, uh, we were there for geostrategic reasons. Um, we won, the Soviets lost. Uh, and if the Afghans want to kill each other, that's their business. Well, uh, kill each other they did uh, by the tens of thousands, um, creating a climate um, uh, that led to the rise of the Taliban, uh, the eventual control by the Taliban of um, uh, Kabul and about 80% of the country, um, uh, the relocation of Al-Qaeda from East Africa uh, to a more salubrious environment for them in Afghanistan, and 9-11. I mean, we've seen the movie. Uh, and the same, the same guys uh, that brought us 9-11 are still out there. Uh, Al-Qaeda is weakened, um, but it is not defeated. Um, the Taliban wants the country back. Um, and should we decide, ah, we're going to drop the effort to get a bilateral security agreement, um, uh, we're not going to follow through on our commitments on funding, uh, well, then you're going to see a replay of, of the early 90s. Yeah. Um, um, with one difference, um, uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda, if anything, are uh, more determined, um, uh, more dedicated, and tougher um, than they were uh, 13 years ago. Um, you know, we've killed all the slow and stupid ones. Um, uh, the ones that are left are formidable adversaries. Yeah. We are in the situation of trying to finalize this agreement that essentially has been agreed to, but the, but uh, the President Karzai won't uh, go through these final steps to put in place an agreement under which the U.S. would uh, would leave some forces behind, but effectively withdraw. Correct me if I over summarize any of this or get it wrong, but. What is the deal with Hamid Karzai? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Is he a fool? Is he just a dictator? Is he a crook? I, I first met uh, President Karzai uh, when I went into Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban to um, uh, reopen the American embassy. Um, I, I arrived in Kabul about 10 days after he did, um, having been uh, named the uh, chairman of the Afghan Interim Authority at the, uh, the Bonn Conference, uh, uh, December 2001. Uh, I was with him virtually every day. We were both in country um, during those initial three or four uh, months. Uh, and most of our conversations at uh, some point would have one or the other of us saying, what the hell do we do now? Uh, country was totally devastated. Uh, Kabul looked like Berlin in 1945. You know, uh, we didn't do it. Taliban didn't do it. Um, the Mujahideen factions did it uh, during the years of the Civil War. Uh, he had nothing to work with it. Um, and when one looks at uh, uh, the strides that have been taken uh, in health, in, in communications, in women's rights, um, in transportation, uh, Afghanistan today is unrecognizable for what it was when he took power. Uh, uh, and do the people of Afghanistan realize that and appreciate that and credit him in some manner for that? You know, this, this is what gives me real faith in Afghanistan's democratic future. Of course they don't. <laughs> it, they're just like Americans. What have you done for me lately? It's a, uh, yeah, that's all great, but uh, you know, what about all these other problems you haven't fixed? Get on with it. Um, uh, so, yes, does he have his foibles? Uh, he certainly does. He has had the worst job in the world, arguably, um, and he's, he's had it uh, for 13 years. Uh, he's survived numerous assassination attempts, um, uh, various uh, political machinations against him. Um, uh, some of the things we've done have raised questions in his mind um, uh, uh, as to where we truly stand vis-a-vis -vis him. Uh, 
But here's probably the most important thing to remember when you're thinking of President Karzai. Uh, uh, he is extremely sensitive about being labeled as the tool or the puppet of the Americans. Uh, he considers that his greatest vulnerability, and I've had conversations with him about it. Uh, a, a predecessor um, uh, of President Karzai back in the 1840s, um, uh, Shah Shoja, um, was basically put in uh, power by uh, the British during their first occupation, um, which did not end well for them. Uh, they lost almost their entire army. Uh, uh, Shah Shoja was seen as a British puppet um, and, uh, and was deposed. Uh, the Taliban used this against Karzai in their propaganda. Uh, uh, he is an American puppet, just like Shah Shoja. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, just like Najibullah, uh, the last leader of Afghanistan under the Soviets, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, executed by the Taliban when they took Kabul. Uh, uh, Hamid Karzai doesn't spend a day without thinking about those examples. Um, uh, and I think we just need to be patient. Okay. Uh, I think he does uh, harbor some, some doubts and misgivings over uh, what U.S. intentions truly are. Uh, uh, he is uh, troubled by um, our efforts to build a stronger relationship with Pakistan, uh, while Pakistan harbors the Taliban leadership and uh, many of its uh, uh, fighters on Pakistani soil, um, uh, where they can organize with impunity. Um, and Karzai asked the question, um, uh, uh, if we are against the Taliban and we are for Afghanistan, why are we seeking to develop a strong relationship with Pakistan and do nothing to uh, eliminate the Taliban safe havens that are killing so many Afghans? Uh, uh, there are answers to that, but... Uh, like what? I mean, it seems like a pretty logical question. Um, uh, well, think of... Um, um, think of the numbers. Um, Pakistan has the eighth largest standing army in the world. Um, Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Uh, Pakistan has a vicious, multifaceted internal insurgency underway. Um, uh, more Pakistani soldiers have died in the frontier region than Afghan and coalition soldiers put together. Uh, um, uh, we have a very strong interest in seeing that a country of 185 million people uh, uh, scratches its way back to a modicum of security and stability. You also remind me of uh, what still galls me from recent history uh, in this sort of category of events more than any other, and that was that immediately after the uh, the invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11, uh, with all of the support that we were receiving at the time from the Pakistanis, it was in the midst of all that that Congress then moved to uh, to block a waiver that Pakistan had long held that allowed their shirts to be sold to the United States without some uh, onerous tariff, uh, and all because of a North Carolina uh, you know, local issue around textile mills in North Carolina, none of which exist anymore. But I, I was so struck at the time of here was an example of our most important ally to the pursuit of our clearest enemy, uh, and yet on the pettiest basis of, uh, of domestic politics, we turn around and slap them. And uh, that still stands. Um, uh, the one single action we could take uh, that would demonstrate to the Pakistani government and people uh, uh, that there truly was a new era in the relationship uh, uh, would be to lift those highly restrictive quotas. Uh, it would make a huge impact, um, again, uh, on attitudes and on the economy. Um, but I don't see it uh, coming to a theater near us anytime soon. I'm curious your thoughts on the general political climate around these very important strategic foreign policy questions. Well, the toxicity uh, in uh, 
uh, national politics uh, uh, in, in, in Washington is extreme, to say the least. Um, and it bleeds off into almost everything. Um, uh, you know, that said, we are a presidential system. Um, and uh, particularly in foreign policy, uh, when the president exhibits um, a real determination to pursue a particular course, um, he normally prevails. And I think we're seeing that in the uh, uh, case of the uh, uh, threatened new round of sanctions uh, from the Senate. Um, uh, President and the Secretary of State uh, feel very, very strongly about this um, uh, and uh, have used the full weight and influence of their offices, uh, particularly the presidency, to, uh, uh, to, to derail these. Um, we're, we're going to need to see that kind of sustained leadership uh, uh, going forward uh, with Iran uh, because there are going to be bumps and there are going to be hiccups. Um, uh, uh, and it's going to require the president to say, you know, everybody calm down. Uh, 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 the um, problems in our relationship um, uh, have grown over a very long time, um, and it will take time to resolve them. Uh, we need to know the Iranian narrative of the relationship with the U.S. Uh, we need to understand that for many Iranians, um, uh, we simply were the successors to the British and the Russians, uh, who had uh, dominated the country, particularly the British, um, uh, for most of the 20th century. It's striking to have a conversation like this, given that it wasn't very many years ago that to have talked for 45 minutes about the Middle East and not have mentioned Israel would have been impossible. But that's what we've just done. Well, we are seeing um, uh, a, a profound revolution uh, in the broader Middle East um, whose eventual outcomes are unpredictable and uncertain. Um, but will unfold uh, over, uh, I think, a, a length of time, and it's likely to get worse before it gets better. Uh, uh, Israel remains what it always has been since the creation of the state, uh, virtually. Um, uh, uh, a close and strong U.S. ally. Um, uh, we are consulting very closely with the Israelis. Uh, who look around them uh, uh, and see a very, very worrisome situation. Um, uh, you know, they share borders uh, uh, with, uh, with Lebanon, where the possibility of a new civil war is not out of the question. They share borders with Syria, where a horrific civil war is a fact. Um, they share a board with Jordan, um, uh, which sees its own stability threatened. Uh, uh, none of this is good for us. None of it is good for Israel. Um, uh, we clearly have uh, taken uh, different views of, um, of Iran. Um, uh, frankly, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Um, uh, when the prime minister or the defense minister um, uh, says there's only one answer to this, and it isn't negotiation. Uh, I think that can be a helpful message to Tehran that, uh, uh, you know, walking away from the table and deciding you just don't want to do this, um, uh, it's too much of a concession, uh, may not be something you really want to do. You've said, though, that uh, very recently, even, that you've written that, that a that there is no military response that would prevent uh, Iran from ultimately obtaining nuclear weapons, that, that's, that that will not is not a way of stopping the acquisition of nuclear arms. Obviously, uh, Israel disagrees with that. We've seen reporting, at least very recently, suggesting that, that they were very close to a military strike or very seriously discussing it very recently. Um, but why is that? Why is it, why do you contend that there is no military option that would stop the, the acquisition? Well, the uh, Iranians have had um, over three decades to 
contemplate the, uh, the lessons of Iraq's uh, nuclear program. Um, it was uh, in 1981 that uh, uh, Israeli aircraft uh, destroyed uh, Iraq's nuclear reactor and <clears throat> put an end to its nuclear program. Uh, uh, so whatever the Iranians are, are, are doing, um, they are doing it with a view to ensure that um, the essence of their program uh, is survivable uh, through redundancy, uh, uh, through uh, 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 very deep underground facilities and so forth, uh, survivable against um, uh, any possible air or air assault um, attack or set of attacks. Um, um, you know, um, maybe they're wrong. I wouldn't want to bet on it. Because the only thing worse than an Iran with nuclear weapons is an Iran with nuclear weapons that one or more countries attempted to prevent them from obtaining by military force and failed. Um, uh, so, you know, let's, uh, let's stick with negotiations. Is Iran the country that, that we thought Iraq was uh, before the Iraq invasion, it, this place that actually is significantly sophisticated, relatively well-educated, relatively middle class, uh, and, that, and that has a leadership cast that, act, despite all of these crazy things about the Holocaust and such that they say, uh, that could actually go back to being what we thought Iran was before 1979, uh, a, a stable, real country that capable of real, rational decision-making? Um, it, it's a great point, Doug. Um, uh, having uh, spent time uh, in Iraq uh, before and after Saddam, uh, having begun my career uh, in Iran, having negotiated with the Iranians uh, both uh, over Afghanistan and over Iraq, uh, uh, I think there are, there are profound differences uh, between the two. Um, uh, uh, Iran and I use the term advisedly, is not a Jeffersonian democracy by any means. Um, uh, it is an authoritarian state. Um, um, it's always been an authoritarian state, whoever rules. Uh, yet, uh, you know, there, there is, uh, I think, a growing spirit of democracy. Um, and we saw this uh, in the election of uh, President Rouhani. Um, uh, yes, one of a list of carefully vetted uh, candidates. Uh, 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 certainly no um, Western liberal. Uh, yet uh, he won by a landslide because he was perceived uh, uh, as the, uh, the most liberal of the available choices. Um, uh, that, if you will, was um, a vote, I think, against uh, uh, the, the harsh authoritarianism represented by the, um, uh, the Supreme Leader and uh, organizations such as the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, Quds Force that uh, supports um, Hezbollah and is actually in the fight in Syria uh, directly. Um, uh, where will Khamenei and um, the Quds Force eventually come down on these negotiations? I don't know. I'm not sure they know. Um, uh, but they are aware that um, uh, the Iranian people are uh, 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 tired of the way uh, things have been running in the country. They are uh, suffering under sanctions, which have not hurt uh, the nuclear program, but certainly have hurt the Iranian people. Um, uh, they want a new way forward. Will that carry the day? Hard to say. Um, but uh, uh, it clearly has given um, Rouhani and um, his foreign minister, Javad Zarif, uh, former permanent representative of Iran to the United States, who knows us quite well, and with whom I have negotiated personally, um, uh, a mandate um, uh, 
uh, to see what they can do. And the Khamenei has spoken out uh, to tell the hardliners, sit down and shut up. Um, um, will he say that straight through? Can't predict. Uh, but there is an atmosphere in Iran um, uh, that um, has caused the, uh, the leadership, uh, uh, <clears throat> the non-elected leadership, um, uh, to say, we better give these a chance. So the stars could align somehow. Well, look, uh, it's an axiom in, in diplomacy uh, uh, that uh, states have neither permanent allies nor permanent enemies. Uh, we had a very close relationship uh, with Iran uh, under the Shah. Uh, and you, you may recall that um, after the uh, bitter experience of Vietnam, um, uh, the uh, Nixon doctrine was promulgated, which basically said uh, we have vital interests in the Middle East. Um, um, uh, we are going to ensure those interests um, are respected, uh, but we are going to look to our allies um, uh, uh, to see that that is the case rather than trying to do it by ourselves like we did in Vietnam. And that was sort of the, the, the twin, twin pillars of um, uh, Persian Gulf stability. Uh, Iran on one side, Saudi Arabia on the other. Um, you know, again, I was there in the early 70s I was on my first tour in the Foreign Service, and uh, we had a very, very tight relationship um, uh, with the Iranians at uh, every level. It's also something that many Americans have either forgotten or never knew. Uh, Israel was represented in Iran um, uh, by a very uh, senior official. Uh, they did not have diplomatic relations, but it was a virtual embassy, uh, and it, uh, it was there for you know, a decade up to the eve of the revolution. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm not predicting that um, uh, we can somehow wave a magic wand and uh, uh, take um, 34 years of uh, uh, a totally malignant relationship and, and have it vanish. It won't work that way. Um, uh, but, uh, we had a close relationship once. Uh, uh, I do not see anything that suggests an, inevitabil an inev inevitability of a permanent enmity. The President of the United States is not far away right now, uh, today. Uh, and if you were sitting here instead of me, what would you say to the President of the United States? What's the advice you'd give him for these, the remainder of his second term? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I know the president has a, a very ambitious and a very important um, uh, domestic agenda. Uh, um, but we're America, uh, and American presidents, after going through the cauldron of the process of getting elected, can actually do more than one thing at one time. Uh, uh, he has a good foreign policy team around him, in, in my judgment, uh, with uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, Secretary Hagel. Uh, um, uh, I think he, he needs to continue uh, uh, his leadership uh, in, um, on the Iranian issue. Uh, he needs to keep reminding Americans um, in and out of Congress uh, why these negotiations are important, um, why they will be difficult, and why they will be take, take time, why we need to exhibit strategic patience. Um, I would like to see him uh, take a more active role um, uh, on Afghanistan. Again, uh, we don't have to use our imaginations uh, to uh, guess at what happens if uh, 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 the current government of Afghanistan is overthrown. Um, we've seen the movie. Um, it, it did not end well. Um, uh, so to, to shift away from uh, a narrative that says we are ending the war in Afghanistan to one that says um, our role and our presence um, uh, uh, is evolving and changing in Afghanistan. Um, 
but our interests remain critical to U.S. national security. Uh, you know, that is the framework for a long-term enduring alliance, and we need to make good on it. Thank you. Thank you.